Hello, welcome to our first topic on object-oriented programming. So I'd like to begin with an analogy. Let's say you go to Brick Oven Bakery here in Northfield and you purchase a delicious lemon poppy seed muffin. They're, they're very good. And you can tell that it's a muffin without knowing the specific ingredients, right? Muffins are cylindrical, bread-like, sweet, and the specific ingredients are just not your concern. Brick oven would be free to switch to a different sweetener or a different lemon flavoring as long as the taste of the muffin was the same. You wouldn't particularly care. The muffin's ingredients and construction are details that probably don't interest you. And in a similar fashion, we're going to think a lot in this course about how implementation is distinct from how an object is used. So implementation versus use. So we are familiar with how strings and arrays can be used to solve problems, whether we want to print out some text, store a collection of related elements. We kind of have an understanding of how those can be used, their semantics within the programming language, what they do when you use them. But we might not know the detail of their inner workings. For example, do all consecutive locations in an array appear close together in the memory of the computer, or are they far apart? In many cases, the answer is they're close together, but for our purposes, the answer is just not important. As long as it behaves like an array, we're good to go. If all we care about is using the array to store this collection of, of items. And so put another way, what we care about is the abstraction of an array, right? The idea, the concept that a sequence of elements, uh, that we have a sequence of elements that can be accessed in any order. Uh, and we don't care about how this abstraction is actually implemented, is actually realized on the computer system as long as that implementation doesn't cause problems. Like as long as it's not really inefficient and slow, Right? If, it's, if it's an efficient implementation, we don't necessarily care about the details. Uh, and this is a, a fundamental idea at the heart of this object-oriented model of programming. So we often, it's often useful to conceptualize a program as a uh, series of manipulations over uh, a series of manipulations performed on input data producing some kind of output. Uh, and so uh, this is a very broad uh, description of a computer program, uh, but it's a useful one to, to think about because uh, in uh, in object oriented programming, which is often abbreviated OOP, this says that a program's data is going to be managed by its objects. And so to make this concrete with some examples, uh, each object is going to manage its own data. So we might have uh, objects like uh, a point a medical record. Um, we might be representing genetic material like DNA in our, uh, in our computer program. And each of these kind of kinds of objects would manage the data specific to what they're representing. So a point would 
its data might be two coordinates in X and Y. A medical record might have uh, the name of, uh, of a patient, their dependents, their insurance operation uh, information, their medical history, etc. And genetic material might be we might be representing the data might be the, the series sequence of base pairs that, that make up that, that gene. So uh, how does so, so we have these objects and they have some information inside of them. And we then the other part of this was that we need that if objects are what is uh, managing our data, we still need the program to have a way to perform manipulations, to interact with that data in some way to actually make the program happen. And so We're going to interact with objects via uh, methods. So, um, and, and methods are going to be like messages that we send to an object. And uh, well, since methods are are defined as uh, functions, they take uh, zero or more parameters. They may return a value, and they're called methods instead of functions because they are associated with a particular object. A function is usually uh, a procedure that's defined kind of independently. It's, it stands on its own. A method is a procedure that's associated with a particular object. And so uh, we might say uh, We might send the message, tell me your length to a string, I'll capitalize it since that's the type name in Java, to, uh, we might send the, the message, tell me your length to a string object, or we might say, uh, we might send the change insurance message to our medical record object. And each of these are uh, interacting with the data that is uh, stored in that object in, in some way. So uh, this first one accesses or reads the data uh, that is present in the object. It, it, it is not modifying the object in, in any way. It is just uh, accessing this particular property, how many characters are in the string, how long the string is. This second one modifies or mutates or writes. There are a number of different terms that are used for this, but uh, this one is telling this object to change its data in some way, right? We're changing the, uh, the insurance. And you might ask, well, why do we need to do this through methods, right? Couldn't our program just go to this piece of insurance information inside this object and say, and change it directly. Well, changing the uh, in insurance, this might be a multi-step operation. Um, doing this might require changing, making the same change to the insurance information for all the dependents. Um, uh, and there might be other steps involved with uh, making sure that the object is in a consistent state. Right. If we just change one piece of it, that may leave it in, a, in an inconsistent state where the different pieces, uh, the insurance, information about the dependents, etc., is no longer 
consistent. And so what we want to do is to just send, have the program send a message to this medical record, right, to call the change insurance method. And then the medical record takes care, the object has code associated with it that then takes care of all the uh, details of making this change and leaving the object in a consistent state. Um, and so this gets at this idea of encapsulation where the object is combining this data for a medical record and this behavior, this method about how and, and what and changing insurance means into this single object. So then the program interacts with it uh, in a kind of simple and consistent way. So. Let's get down to some terminology. And there is definitely some terminology when it comes to object-oriented programming. All right, first up, we have class. So a class is the definition of what it means to be a particular kind of object. Um, this is going to include both data and behavior, right? It's going to include both the, the different kinds of data the medical record stores and also behavior like a method that changes the insurance. And um, for example, a rectangle class It would have both a height, a width. This would be the data that defines a rectangle. And then it might have a compute area where Compute area is a method we could call on objects of this class uh, in order to get the area. So class, how is that different from object? So I said a class is a definition of an object. An object is an instance of a class. So we might have, we would have we have one definition of a rectangle class that I've represented with this box and then We might have many instances of this class, each of which have their own data. So uh, this might be height 7, width 2, height 4.5, width 1, height 3, width 10. So these all have different data. But the formula for computing the area, this method, is the same for all of them. It just takes the data. It just takes height and width, width for a particular rectangle, multiplies them together, and that gives you the area. So these three instances of, is of this class, they share a definition. So they have the same, the, the same types of data. They all have a height and a width. They just can be different for each instance. And they also share the methods for that defined in that class. Uh, which use that data or, or modify the data for that particular instance in some way. And uh, this is a much nicer model. If we have like three rectangles, um, 
and our Java code has like uh, we declare our rectangle R1, R2, and R3. Uh, and this is, for, uh, this is opposed to the situation where uh, we don't have a, a, a rectangle class that encapsulates of these multiple pieces of data and this behavior all together, and we have instead width one, width two, width three, height one, height two, height three, right? We have separate variables for all the different uh, pieces of data that we need for these three rectangles. Uh, we don't want to do that. We want to group data together. Um, We want to encapsulate uh, data and behavior together where it makes sense, and that's what uh, object-oriented programming is going to give us. So other important terms, we have field. And a field is a variable associated with a class or object. And this class definition uh, defines which fields instances of that class have. So the, the class definition includes which fields, which pieces of data uh, are present. And like uh, other variables in Java, fields are declared to have a certain type. So we would begin our rectangle class, class rectangle, open curly bracket, and then we would declare the fields of that uh, object are typically declared first. And so we need to give them a type and a name, semicolon. And a closing curly brace uh, at the, to, to show where uh, the class definition ends. And so this class definition is what says, all right, every instance of uh, a rectangle, every rectangle object has a width uh, field of type double and a height field of type double. And there's the other part uh, of our class definitions. In addition to data, we have methods, and these are Functions, functions associated with a class or object. So uh, to continue with the rectangle example, we would have something that looks like this. And so what is going on here? Um, right, this was the type for our field. This was the name of the field, how we refer to it. Uh, in our method, we give it a name. Any parameters that the method uh, would take, compute area does not take any. Uh, it, um, uh, they would appear here. And this, what does this double out here represent? It is the return type of this method. So just like we have to declare what type of variable is, for a method, 
we have to declare what type of value does it return. Uh, and so Java needs to know what type of method returns. So for example, if we assigned a variable to the value returned by compute area, the compiler needs to check, all right, are those types compatible? Do they, do they match? And so we have to specify a return type here. What would actually appear inside the curly braces for this method? We would return width times height, remembering our semicolon. And uh, inside our class definition, we can uh, refer to uh, the fields of, uh, of that class just with their, with their name alone. Um, and this will allow a program, if we had a uh, variable rect that was uh, of, of type rectangle, we could do something like System dot out dot print line double quote area equals and then plus say so instead of compute area, let's change this one to get area. Since that, that's a little more appropriate since this, uh, uh, this method is kind of retrieving some property about, uh, about the object, even if it's one that is computed from the data we're actually storing. But uh, these sort of methods usually start with get. Um, Rec.get area. And so this would print out area equals and then the area of the rectangle. And so this would be kind of how a program would interact with uh, a rectangle object, an instance of this class. It would have a variable that was a rectangle and then dot method name, parentheses, putting any arguments to that method inside the parentheses uh, is how that would work. So, Running out of room, so we're going to define another term. This time the term is constructor, and this is a special type of method. Um, and it's special in that it is called whenever. A new instance of that class is created. And its purpose is that it initializes the data for that object to put it in some sort of predictable and consistent initial state. Um, and so constructors will often have parameters that specify some or all of the initial values the data uh, of that object uh, should have. And constructors always have the same name as the class. So a rectangle constructor, which is usually the, the constructors are usually the first methods to be, uh, uh, they, they appear first after the fields are defined. And they have the same name as the class, so we have rectangle, and they don't have a return value. Um, uh, they, because uh, a constructor will never have a return statement. Um, it, uh, it's kind of part of this larger object creation process, uh, and so it just has different syntax than all other kinds of methods. Uh, and so our rectangle is going to take two doubles as parameters, W and H. And its job is to initialize 
because uh, if you recall, when we declare a variable in Java, it takes on a default value. So width and height here uh, both have zero as their default value. Uh, this is not a sensible value for the width or height of a rectangle. Um, and when we construct, when we create a new rectangle instance, we're going to say that you have to specify uh, a width and a height that it will start at, and then our constructor will assign our two fields to the parameter values that are passed in. And so before we would be able to print out the area of a rectangle, we would need to say rectangle rect equals Tangle five seven and here we're using this Java special Java keyword new as part of a statement that creates a new instance of a class that creates a new object. So uh, and this in this case we're both declaring this variable rect to be of type rectangle and also giving it an, an initial value, which is a new instance of the rectangle class with a width of five and a height of seven. And so this is where this, cons this is how this constructor gets used is with this new keyword uh, like so. And uh, if we hadn't given it this initial value of new rectangle and just done rectangle rect semicolon, it would take on its default value, which for all object types uh, is null. So, if we just had rectangle foo semicolon, this would have The default value null, all lowercase, it's a special value in Java, similar to capital N none in Python, meaning just the absence of any value um, or indicating the absence of any value. Uh, and so uninitialized uh, object variables have, to, uh, have the value of null. All right, last few terms are actually particular varieties of method. So we have what's called an accessor, which is um, a method that just retrieves uh, some some data or information about the object um, and doesn't modify that object uh, in any way. And in Java, it's best practice to always retrieve uh, object data via uh, methods um, or almost always and never by directly directly accessing the fields, and we'll we'll talk more about kind of how how to think about that and how it works in Java in the next topic. Um, but like we had get area, we might also have another method get width that just says. return width, and we have a similar one, get height, for returning the height. Uh, and these are the ways that we would access uh, this data rather than um, referring, to it, referring to it directly. And uh, uh, this 
kind of always interacting with objects through methods uh, enables a kind of a level of abstraction where the object can change, the underlying implementation can change uh, what data it's actually using. Um, and as long as it changes the uh, implementation of, say, the get width method to still return the appropriate value, uh, then code using that class can still use it in the same way, even though the underlying implementation has changed. Uh, and so these accessor methods are usually named get x, where x is one of the fields uh, of the um, of the object. So like we had get width and, and a get height. We also have mutator methods, which are instead of just reading a property, are going to be methods that modify object data. And so uh, I will erase our get area to make room for a set width method. where now we have a, uh, uh, one of these methods that takes uh, a parameter, just like our constructor did. And one thing that might jump out to you is that where the return type is, uh, you can see that I have written void. And this indicates that the method doesn't return anything, right? There's no return statement uh, in this set with method. Uh, unlike Python, Java does not just have every function return none. Uh, if there's no return statement, a function can actually just not return a value at all, meaning that you can't say assign, uh, you can't say like, you can't set a variable equal to a call to set with, because set with has no value, that just is not uh, valid Java code. And we've actually seen void somewhere else before. We've seen it on the main method. Uh, it's one of the one of the words in our public static void main uh, for our main method. It's because main is a method that doesn't return anything. So its return type is void. And so uh, you will often see classes that define mutators uh, for some or all of their fields where we have a rectangle and we can change its width. Uh, and we could also have a set height to change its height. All right, that concludes object-oriented programming one. Uh, there's, uh, as usual, practice problems in the notes as well as, for reference, kind of the full uh, rectangle class since it was sort of scattered uh, about on the board here. And uh, I look forward to seeing your questions and we'll uh, continue with object-oriented programming two for Friday's topic.